You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves, or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast. I have John Hart. He's a professor at uh, Berkeley University. We're going to be talking about uh, global change, ecosystem biology, and biodiversity. So, uh, John, thanks for coming. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Yeah. Well, if you would tell me a little bit of details about your research and your work, what do you focus on? I've been focused for the last 30 years on how climate change is going to affect our lives and also our ecosystems. I've been studying this on various uh, habitats in the mountains of Colorado, in California, and actually in places in Tibet and around the world. The uh, concern that I had about 35 years ago when I got interested in this topic was that not only would it be devastating for uh, biodiversity, uh, if the climate kept warming, but ecosystems would respond to climate change in ways that would make the climate problem even worse uh, than it would be otherwise. In other words, there are feedbacks between climate and the environment, between climate and ecosystems, and these feedbacks are going to exacerbate the global warming problem. And so I want, I've been studying that phenomenon for the last 30 years. Hmm. And I know you'll probably roll your eyes, but you know, I just have to get it out right in the beginning. What, what's your thought on the fact that you know, climate change has become a political football instead of just relying on the science? And what does the science actually say in your, and you've been around it for a long time. So what do you see? Yeah, the science um, the, um, science unambiguously tells us that the planet is warming at an unprecedented rate, that it's doing so because of human activity, in particular the burning of fossil fuels, and that this warming is leading to an earth that could well be uninhabitable for humans, let alone all the rest of the creatures that we share the planet with. So how could such a thing become political where people say, oh, scientists don't agree and they do agree and they, you know, but where is that coming from? Is there a particular study that somehow is compromised or what's your thought? We we call the folks who don't get the science denialists. They deny scientific reality. And where are they coming from? Mostly they're coming from large vested interests, economic interests, that will suffer if the planet stops using fossil fuels. Oil companies, coal companies, um, they are um, doing all they can to put up smoke screens so that the public gets confused about what the science actually says. And they're doing all they can to influence politicians to block any kind of legislation that might help uh, reduce the threat of climate change. So it's mostly, I guess you'd say, greed. They are um, going, they will suffer some if uh, 
we respond as we must to climate change. And they don't want to. They want to keep things going just as they were. Right, right. So what uh, what does the trajectory look like with our models, uh, you know, over the next 20, 50, 100 years? Yeah, Where are that, we headed that, right now with current uh, that's, a, that's a great question. And the simplest way to say where we're headed is to look back at the last 30 years and look at the trends that we've seen. We've seen the warmest years on record in the very most recent years. We've seen the ocean warming. We've seen polar ice melting. We've seen storms becoming more intense and more frequent, like Hurricane Dorian. We've seen droughts become more intense and more frequent, like the recent um, four-year drought in the um, uh, southwestern United States and in other parts of the world. So all of these um, trends are simply going to get worse and worse and worse. We will lose most of our north polar ice. We will see food production all around the world impaired by drought. We will see sea level rise inundating coastal cities and infrastructure. And the um, effect is going to accelerate. As the temperatures rise, uh, we start to see these feedback effects that I mentioned earlier kicking in. And that will speed up the rate at which the planet warms and make the warming even greater than it would be. So picture what we've been seeing just the glimpses of in the last 20 or 30 years. And now imagine multiplying that fivefold or tenfold over the next 30, 40, 50 years. That's what we're in store for if we don't take action essentially immediately. And... Um, begin to reduce our dependence on fossil fuel. Are there places that would benefit, or do you think everywhere on Earth? Is well, that, that's an interesting story. For a while, Russian scientists had tried to um, argue, and maybe you know this was pol politically motivated, but they were arguing that perhaps in Siberia, a little warming would be good because there are places with huge source supplies of mineral resources in Siberia. And a lot of this land is really um, hostile to human uh, uh, settlement because of the cold temperatures and the perpetually uh, frozen ground that's hard to extract resources from. So they were arguing at one point that a little warming might be good for them. Well, guess what's happening now in Russia? First of all, the permafrost is melting. And so, yeah, the ground is no longer frozen, but the roads that one might build to go into that region to extract the resources uh, sink into the wet um, soil when the permafrost melts. And so they become mm -hmm difficult for get large trucks up into northern Siberia. Secondly, Russia is having uh, some of the worst forest fires anywhere around the world. Um, not as bad as Brazil today, but, but close. And uh, this is because of longer, hotter summers, uh, heat waves, drought, all making the problem of wildfire worse. So Russia has learned to its regret that climate change is no friend um, for them. It's going to bring about very difficult conditions. I don't, I cannot think of any place on the planet that will clearly benefit from global warming, except maybe the headquarters of Exxon, who will continue to rake in huge amounts of money if um, we keep burning fossil fuel and keep warming the planet. So is it safe to say that global climate change is literally is endangering all life on Earth? Yes. Um, In the near term. We have already begun to see signs of this. Um, wildflowers in the, in the alpine meadows in the Colorado Rockies are um, being displaced by woody shrubs. Uh, this is some of the research I've been doing. Um, we've seen 
uh, devastation in some of our coral reefs around the world, like the Great Barrier Reef and others. We've seen uh, damage to tide pool life along the Pacific coast from warmer temperatures. Uh, the um, uh, fires in the Amazon, which are destroying large patches of Amazonian tropical forest, are partly the result of climate change. There are other factors involved there as well. So, yeah, we're seeing the effects already. But as I say, we're just seeing the, the tip of an iceberg. It's going to get worse and worse. Are there any, um, I mean, will nature act to counterbalance this at all, even though it may not be enough? I mean, what are some of the counterbalances there, that will probably happen? Well, you know, for a while, people thought maybe as we put more carbon dioxide into the air, maybe that will encourage the forest to grow more because the carbon dioxide is the source of the carbon that the trees take up when they grow. And so the hope was uh, the trees will grow more and that will take the carbon dioxide out of the air. Unfortunately, that's not the way it, the world works. Um, most plants are not limited by the amount of carbon in the air. They're limited by things like water and nitrogen and phosphorus. And if anything, those limits are going to get more severe because of factors like drought, um, which will reduce the water available for plant growth. So the biggest single hope for some kind of um, uh, uh, cure from the natural world was that the forest would grow bigger and take up the carbon. But the evidence today suggests just the opposite, that with climate change, the forests are suffering and therefore taking up less carbon. And so uh, the carbon dioxide levels actually increase because of the forest response. And that makes the global warming problem worse. And then, you know, from what I've read, the price of solar per kilowatt hour has come way down. It may not be you know, equal to uh, fossil fuels, but it seems like renewable energies, uh, the, you know, the, the economics of them are improving a lot. What, what's, what's the plan look like to slow down, you know, global climate change and maybe well, even reverse it? What's the new there's involved? a reason. There's a good reason why states like Texas and uh, other states in the country are actually building wind turbines and putting a lot of money into wind energy. And the good reason is that wind generated electricity is now as cheap as coal generated electricity um so uh, the economics is now favorable what's it's the barrier to more and to the use of more and more wind and sun is really mostly political um and there are subsidies that we give to the fossil fuel industries which are um impeding a transition to renewable clean energy but coal is on its way out it's in it, the signs are clear and despite all the efforts and the um the rhetoric of the current <clears throat> administration in Washington to say that we're going to um save coal coal is not savable coal is on its way out it's it's dirty and it's becoming less and less affordable and it's, of course, a major contributor to global warming. Uh, the next, the real fight is going to be over the transportation sector and the use of oil today to make gasoline. Um, what we, of course, have to do is replace our internal combustion engines with electric vehicles. And slowly that's happening. But the way to speed up that transition is to impose fuel efficiency standards on the automobiles. And this is what the Trump administration is now opposing. Um, so there's going to be an interesting court battle to see whether uh, states like California have the right to impose stricter fuel efficiency standards than the ones that uh, Trump's EPA are wanting to impose. And we'll see how that turns out. But the um, 
Again, in the long run, we are going to be a nation running on electric vehicles. The only question is, are we going to delay and delay that transition until climate change has become catastrophic, or are we going to make the transition expeditiously and um, prevent the worst of global warming? But just as coal is on its way out, the in, the, the internal combustion engines years are numbered and it's just a question of if it's 30 or 40 years it's going to be too late and we will have we will see catastrophic climate change if we can make that transition over the next 10 or 15 years we could um, get through and have a livable climate well what if we transition but nations like china don't and they end up putting uh yeah, well, three times China the today is the world's there. leading producer of wind turbines and solar panels. They are, um, but aren't they also the leading emitter of, uh, you know? Yeah, but they, the their leadership recognizes the problem, unlike our leadership, and right. they, they understand that if this problem is not dealt with, uh, no country on earth is going to have a viable economy. So, yeah, they're they're not doing enough fast enough, but they're at least pointing in the right direction, unlike mm. the current administration in Washington. Um, so, yeah, China, if, if we act and China and India don't do anything, then uh, game's over. But I think that if we um, return to the Paris Accord and made the commitment, imposed fuel standards, so on, we could, um, we would be encouraging the other countries in the world to do the same. Everybody wants to be, you know, an economic winner. And right. when China sees the U.S. turning its back on sensible solutions, then it says, gee, if we do it and the U.S. doesn't, we won't survive this. So there. In a sense, we all have to work together. And the country that has uh, opted out of working together is not China, it's the US. Opted out in the sense that Trump has pulled out of the Paris Accord and essentially said there's no problem. So other countries see this and they say, well, geez, that makes it difficult for us to act. Um, quick question about so in terms of fuel, automobiles, transportation, what percentage of global emissions do they comprise? Well, in the U.S., the percentage is quite large. We are a nation on wheels, and uh, something like 30% of our emissions come from the transportation sector. Um, okay. Worldwide, the percentage is lower, but not a lot lower. It, it might be – I don't have that number in front of me – but I would guess it's on the order of 20%, um, which is still large, maybe 25%. Um, electricity is um, a big factor, but the transition to renewable electric generation, clean electricity generation, is happening. It's, it needs to be speeded up, but it's happening. And now what we need to do is electrify the automobile sector, which means we're going to have to have more electricity than we have today because we're going to be replacing uh, uh, gasoline with electric um, generation. And that means we have to speed up tremendously the rate at which we're generating renewable electricity, more wind turbines, more solar power plants. and um, this is not happening fast enough, but at least the trend is right. Um, so I'm hopeful that uh, clean electricity will happen. What I'm worried about is that uh, clean transportation is going to be harder to achieve. <clears throat> what would be a, um, a miles per gallon benchmark that would essentially force the auto industry to go electric? Is there a certain number range? Like what's it at now, and and what the what? what well, I think o Obama had it right. He he had come up with a um, fuel a set of fuel efficiency standards. You know, they vary with the class of vehicle, but um, for regular 
passenger cars, it was uh, 50 plus miles per gallon. And that is a was a very a well-crafted piece of regulation because it was both achievable today by the car makers. The car makers were, you know, they griped and groused about it a bit, but they can do that. Um, and yet it also is a tight enough standard that it will strongly encourage uh, the transition to electric. Um, but today in um, many parts of the of the world, transitioning to electric is not good because there still is a lot of coal generated electricity. So if you're running an electric car on coal generated electricity, uh, it doesn't help things. So you, we've got to accelerate the transition to clean electricity and at the same time, tighten the fuel efficiency standards and increase uh, decrease the subsidies to the oil industry and uh, possibly increase subsidies to renewable energy production. Okay, so we've got the, you know, the transportation industry. What's another really big chunk of emissions that needs to be addressed? Where is that coming from? Well, b b besides transportation and electricity, but there is industry. And, um, and uh, in many homes, of course, are heated by fuel oil um, or natural gas. And so that sector, um, that's sort of the third major sector. Um, industry uh, worldwide is on the order of 20, 25% of total production, uh, uh, greenhouse gas production. And everything from, you know, steel making, cement manufacturing, uh, every kind of factory you can imagine uses energy in some way or another to um, uh, operate. And that is also a difficult sector to um, uh, to change. To uh, and it, But there is some progress. I think the connection with energy is interesting because a lot of this has to do with consumption, how much how much throughput, how much material goods does the world consume? And uh, many people have argued, and I agree, that in the uh, rich nations, we are over-consuming. And we could be recycling uh, at a greater rate instead of manufacturing new things from scratch, which generally takes more energy. Um, uh, we... Um, we're kind of a throwaway society that we get tired of an appliance and we junk it and then we buy, buy a new one and making that new appliance and also operating it uh, costs a lot of energy. So the industrial sector is a tough one and I don't have a simple set of answers for what to do there, um, but increasing the efficiency of manufacturing is clearly important. Reducing the throughput, in other words, the amount of consumption is a part of the answer. And using electricity instead of fossil fuel to run the factories is an answer if the electricity is produced from sun and wind, not from right. coal. In terms of home heating and cooling, the um, biggest changes that have been made so far mostly have to do with increasing the efficiency of homes. Double pane glass in our windows made a huge difference in uh, reducing wintertime uh, heating uh, need, the use of fuel oil to heat our homes. Um, their white roofs are an uh, interesting solution to the problem of houses that are too hot in the summer. We can reduce the demand for air conditioning by um, putting lighter colored shingles on our rooftops. Um, I recently had to redo my roof. It was a 25-year-old roof, and I got the lightest colored shingles I could. They're sort of a, a light gray instead of the dark, nearly black shingle that's typical. And the result the sad was thing is immediate. A, a lot of HOAs cry about that kind of stuff. They cry about Absolutely. solar. It's, it's 
It's restricted, actually, in a lot of places. It's ridiculous. I'm sorry, they do what? I said homeowners associations are literally saying no in a lot of areas to solar, to different colored shingles, to things like that, which make it impossible for a, you know, a significant number of homeowners to do this. But anyway, but go ahead. What, what were you saying? But why are they saying no? Community? Why do they say no? Oh, they, they say it violates community standards and they won't let you put up solar and a number of uh, developments oh, that boy. I've spoken to. At, at least out here, shingles. out here in California, we've not had that problem. Um, hmm. But um, yeah, increasingly you see lighter colored roofs. So you're reflecting the summer sunlight and that makes a huge difference in the heat load to the house. And interestingly, you know, in summer, the sun is high in the sky at noon. So the sun beats down on the roof. If you lighten the roof, you don't decrease the heat gain from the sun in winter very much because in winter, the sun is lower in the sky and it's mostly hitting the the walls of the house, the outside uh, vertical walls rather than the roof. So it's kind of a win-win to, to do this. and it, it um, really increases the comfort level in the home to have a white or a light colored roof. And as far as I know, um, I've not encountered uh, any complaints from neighbors or communities about this. That's good. So what, how do you, uh, have you experienced that it's impacted your electric bill by having lighter, lighter colored shingles? Yeah, I also have solar panels on my roof. So um, okay. uh, I put those in about 15 years ago, and that reduced my electric bill tremendously. Um, and then just a year ago, when I had to re redo my roof, um, we went to the light-colored shingles. So now we have light-colored shingles, and on top of them, we have our solar panels. Um, so we're, we're doing as much as we can just to you know, make our own uh, little home um, sustainable. So how much needs to be done? How much do emissions need to be reduced in order for us to be on a sustainable path and in what time frame? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because um, I, uh, I see a good deal of confusion about this. There's this idea that we have to reduce emissions to zero. Um, and that's a very difficult thing to do. For example, uh, running airplanes on anything other than fossil fuel would be very, very difficult. Um, the good news is that you don't have to reduce emissions all the way to zero to essentially deal with the global warming problem. Today, in, if you look at just the last few years, each year, we emit to the atmosphere about 10 billion tons of carbon as carbon dioxide. But at the end of each year, only about 5 billion extra tons are in the air. 5 billion have left the air and gone into soil and forests and natural processes, things that um, um, are what we call sinks for carbon. A lot of it goes into the oceans. It just gets absorbed by the oceans. If we could reduce emissions down to 50% of what we currently emit, cut, cut emissions by a factor of two, then we would actually see no increase in the amount in the atmosphere at the end of the year. The sinks would take up an amount equal to what we emitted. Now, that's still not good enough because we don't want to stabilize the atmosphere at today's level. We have to draw it down. But if we could reduce emissions down to one quarter of what they are today, then we would see the level in the air slowly dropping. And I think our goal should be to get emissions down as much as we can, but it's not necessary to get to zero emissions there's nothing magic about the number zero. We would start to see the climate uh, improving. We'd see the level of carbon dioxide in the air dropping if we could reduce emissions to a quarter of what they are today, because the natural sinks, the ocean in particular, would take up more than what we emit, at least for a while, at least for a decade. And so I 
been arguing that what we need to do is reduce emissions as much as we can, as fast as we can, as smartly as we can, but don't think that we have to get to zero emissions. That's a very difficult goal, and we don't want you know, the perfect to um, get in the way of achieving the good enough. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.